Welcome, Małgorzata Bonikowska, the Center for International Relations and the Think Tank Institute. Uh, welcome to our book talk. Uh, today we discuss a very special book for, for us because it's the book co-produced by us as well, together with Osteria Editing Publishing House in Poland. It's a Polish version translation of uh, a German book called Jeder Mensch, Everyone in English, uh, written by uh, by uh, Fendirant for Shira, who is not with us today, but uh, both the guests who are with me today will talk about the book and will replace the author very well. Mm -hmm. Professor Manfred Novak, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Nice to see you. Professor Novak is a very well-known lawyer, uh, an Austrian working from uh, mostly from Vienna, but very well known in the circles of human rights lawyers. And we have Adam Bodnar, Professor Bodnar. Dzień dobry, Adamie. Uh, hello, dzień dobry. Uh, good to see you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Professor Bodnar is a lawyer as well, very well known to the Polish public because of his term as an ombudsman since recently. Now he's a dean at University SWPS in Warsaw, dean of the uh, law faculty. Both gentlemen are engaged in this initiative, which is quite interesting one. The initiative is called the same way like the book, Everyone, Każdy Człowiek in Polish, Jeden Mensch in Germany. So first question to Manfred, if you can explain how come Ferdinand von Schirach came with this idea and what is exactly in the book? Yeah, thanks, first of all, for um, inviting me to this short talk that we have. Um, I mean, Ferdinand von Schirr, he's a very well-known author, but also filmmaker and a person in the, in, particularly in the German-speaking uh, world. And uh, he felt that um, the challenges of the 21st century are different from the challenges that we had in the 20th century when most of the human rights instruments have been drafted. So thinking about um, climate change and in general, the environmental crisis that we are in, thinking about digital self-determination, the, the digitalization of the world, uh, including artificial intelligence, they're providing great opportunities, but also they are really challenges and there are many risks in there. Um, particularly also for the younger generation. Then, of course, the globalization of the, of the economy in times of neoliberalism uh, is creating huge prog problems like uh, a growing economic inequality that is undermining the, uh, the democratic coherence, the social contract in our societies. And he feels <clears throat> that human rights have always been developed since the late 18th century in reaction to the major threats and challenges and it's the same now so he took the european union charter of fundamental rights um, as the basis but it could also have been the the european convention on human rights or any un instruments because we are talking about about global challenges but he feels this should be an initiative of the European Union, if all its member states. And he said, um, we have the EU Charter, but these rights to a clean environment, to digital self-determination, to also living in a world where I can trust that um, the products that I am consuming are not produced in violation of human rights, etc. Um, that these should be added as new rights in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. And he wants to do that with a, a kind of a mass movement. He doesn't want to go the normal way of going now to the European Commission and can say, can you start the process, whatever. No, he wants to do it by popular support in all the 27 member states of the European so Union. So before we just jump into this movement, I want just to concentrate on this idea of Ferdinand von Schirach, which is a brand new idea. It was launched uh, just recently to present new rights, new six new rights, new articles, which could be added to the 
Charter of Human Rights of the EU. So Adam, as a lawyer, as an ombudsman, former ombudsman, what do you think about this idea? What do you think about this proposal? Does it make sense really to add something to what we already have in the situation where it seems like the Europeans don't even know the charter we have today? Uh, I would say that the fact that Europeans do not know the charter is not such an uh, unexpected thing, because usually when everything is in order, when rights are not violated heavily, people are basically using those rights, and rights are for the institutions to be followed, like the European Parliament is following in the legislation, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, the Commission is also uh, has to respect the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, and the Court of Justice is just uh, uh, using the language of the charter in increasing number of, of judgments. So you want but, to say that we don't see maybe, you know, these rights, but they are there. They are, yeah, they, they are there and they, they work. And, you know, with every passing year, we see that they have huge influence on how the EU law operates. But I think what is the value of this proposal by Ferdinand von Schirach is that he's not proposing some another international human rights treaty some another UN charter on, you know, rights for the 22nd century or 21st century or whatever. But he thinks like quite uh, in a pragmatic way. So he says like this, you know, I see that the major power here uh, that is uh, giving the indication to the world about the value of rights is the European Union. So we have to push for the adoption of those rights at the EU level, because thanks to this and be, thanks uh, to the, let's say, moral power of the European Union, there is a chance that in the European Union those rights will be respected and thereafter they will uh, have impact on the remaining parts of the, uh, of the world. Moreover, he claims that, you know, when we look into the Charter, it has been adopted more than 20 years ago. Um, uh, so, uh, many years have passed already, and the world has really changed significantly, mostly due to the new technologies, globalization, uh, uh, disinformation, but also due to the climate change. And we have, so we to, have to catch up with this reality. Exactly. That's what you exactly. So, 20 years is already quite a lot, and it seems that, uh, you know, uh, such courts like the European Court of Human Rights have a so-called evolving interpretation of uh, of human rights. But with the EU law, it does not work this way. You, you have to uh, put certain things into the language of treaties, and the EU charter is regarded as a part of the EU treaties, in order for those rights to be followed. And, and the timing is pretty good, because right now we have the conference on the future of Europe. So you cannot imagine like the better time of uh, for the discussion about new rights than just now. The conference is all, almost over. Uh, the European Day, you know, May is a typical European month, so we will discuss the effects of this conference. But I have to go back to Manfred asking why, because we know that Ferdinand von Schirach is very rarely, you know, visible in public. He doesn't want really to 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 be seen to 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 present his ideas even. But he wrote this book, which is more like a manifesto. Why do you think it's it's important to read this book. We just published the Polish version. Why the readers in Poland should really take this book and read? I think it is less for reasons of the law and how the law is formulated. That's something for the lawyers and the lawmakers to do. It is much more the, the idea behind this whole book. Uh, we are living in very, very difficult times. Um, and we don't really know what kind of world uh, we pass on to the next future generations. Let's see uh, the war in Ukraine just and, next doors from us. Exactly. I mean, there would also be um, another challenge, and that is the increasing militarization of international relations and uh, new wars that we didn't think that would have been possible. So there's also something like the right to peace, not only a, a collective right to a clean uh, environment. But, but also... at the same time, don't you think it's it's a little bit, how to say, ironic that we discuss the human rights in the situation where Russia violates all their rights during, you know, this war? 
Yeah, but on the other hand, I think um, <clears throat> I think this war is different. I mean, uh, we we see every day what is happening because of social media, etc. So um, uh, this war is also related to daily human rights violations and uh, war crimes, etc. And I think that has a different impact. It's uh, it's also the growing human rights awareness of people saying this is simply unacceptable, um, and I. From, from that point of view, I think um, it is a new challenge. And again, a few years ago, we wouldn't have been dreaming, thinking that this is possible, but it is possible. So we have to deal with that um, as, as well and also see what, and I hope really that the war that uh, President Putin started uh, in the Ukraine would have, it has already many positive effects in the sense of Europe is becoming much more united um, and, um, and and the world is becoming more united. I mean, the Russian Federation is now a pariah state. It is very isolated in the, in, in the world. Um, and we should learn from this then, and I hope it will have a deterrent effect uh, for, for future wars. Um, but we have to go further. We have to say, what do we need in order to prevent this kind of uh, aggressions from, from, from happening. And that would be thinking much in a broader way, uh, also dis disarmament, uh, dealing with nuclear weapons. Uh, we have not really found a good solution uh, because under international law, it's not yet fully prohibited, although I think it is prohibited. So Adam, how do you see this kind of coincidence that we here have this proposal from Ferdinand von Chirach written, of course, before the war started, and then we confront it with, you know, human rights violations, the existing human rights we already have in the charter um, in Ukraine. And do you think this discussion right now makes sense? I think it makes sense because uh, on the one hand, uh, we have to do everything what is possible in order to uh, let's say, to come back to core human rights uh, and how to repair them, how to find accountability for violations. And in this regard, I think we have to talk a lot about prohibition of torture, inhuman or degrading treatment, about right to life, about humanitarian protection, uh, but also about the role of international uh, bodies such as the ICC, International Criminal Court, or maybe some other courts that would have to be established in order to adjudicate the crime of aggression by the Russian Federation. And so, so basically, in my opinion, the war is uh, to a great extent about coming back to basics. Uh, it is about talking, uh, you know, about the values stemming from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and uh, to what extent the contemporary world uh, is securing those uh, guarantees, whether we need to rebuild international organizations such as the the Council of Europe, OSCE, or maybe even the United Nations, you know, so there are many questions open. Uh, and, uh, but it does not mean that talking about the, our reaction to the contemporary biggest challenge, we should forget about those challenges that were existing before and that would not escape from us uh, uh, as a result of war. Because, uh, you know, the uh, the climate change uh, or our climate, our planet, is not telling us, okay, so I will wait now, right now, three, four years for you, you will solve all your uh, daily problems with Russia, with Ukraine, and then we'll come back to the discussion on the, on the climate. No, the, Polish, uh, the, the planet Earth is saying, I'm changing every day. Uh, the clock ticks. The clock ticks and you have to resolve this. The same with the technolo technological change. Uh, it, it is there, you know, and uh, uh, moreover, Russia is even producing more and more disinformation. The world is becoming more and more divided. Uh, and, uh, uh, and even uh, Internet might not be like the common value for the whole mankind, but in the Internet might be uh, very much divided into, into parts. Uh, and this planet. is exactly about new laws uh, Ferdinand von Schirach proposes, right? Exactly. To, to think about this sphere, which was not really existing 20 years ago in such a scale. Uh, exactly. And that's why uh, we have to talk about those rights, maybe. Uh, and we have to think how to 
put into the language of rights some of those uh, challenges that are existing here and they will be with us uh, in uh, upcoming years and uh, generations. Manfred, I just want to get back to you because you said that uh, to take this book and read it is more for everyone. It's not really for lawyers. It's for every one of us. Really, the initiative is called Everyone, Każdy uh, Człowiek in Polish. Uh, so I just want to, um, to, to get back to what you said, that it's more about thinking process. About It's like provocation a little bit to provoke us to really think about uh, what to uh, do to uh, uh, to have certain new rights, even if the formula of these articles proposed by Ferdinand von Schirach may be controversial. How do you see really the, the, the existing written articles he proposes? Do you agree with them or do you have doubts to formulate it this way? Um, I think uh, they are formulated like other human rights are also formulated in a very, very easy way. Um, and uh, it's then for the lawyers to actually interpret them. It's for the courts and uh, so like the right to life is also everyone has the right to life. But what does that mean? What are the state obligations? Uh, do we have to protect the right to life against other, I don't know, criminals? Do we have to reduce the rate of accidents, etc.? That is something that is not written, but it is interpreted by the courts, by literature, by, by academics, etc. And it's the same here. I think everyone has the right to live in a well-protected, healthy environment um, is very lapidar. It's 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 uh, very general. Very, yeah, may very, seem too general, right? Yeah, yeah, but uh, I think it's good to have it in the, such a general way, because then we have to see when we are confronted with a particular um violation and we had uh, recent cases for instance in germany where the constitutional court the federal court has decided um when uh, fridays for future activists have brought a case against the federal republic of germany saying yes the government has not that done enough in order to comply with the paris climate goals um and that's then the the, the application of such a right so if I understand correctly, it's an extra tool the, the, the rights give us to really execute these rights. Adam, in your practical, you know, in practical terms, from even your term of being ombudsman, what is it really the, in practical terms, the use of the charter and what could it be if we add, if any, in future, these articles? I think that when we are talking about the practical use of uh, any charter articles or any fundamental rights articles, we tend to go immediately to the, into the direction of thinking about strategic litigation, about making different cases before courts and then making those rights uh, uh, used in the, in the practice of uh, litigation, in the practice of resolving some uh, strategic issues and cases. And of course, that is the value of putting um, uh, some additional rights into the charter because they gain a status of the primary law. And thanks to this, you may achieve some interesting results. So, for example, that kind of cases like this, the one decided by the German Constitutional Court could appear at the EU level. That at a certain point, the Court of Justice could say that, OK, uh, let's look into the uh, treaty. Uh, let's look into the climate change uh, obligations by the EU. And the Court of Justice would say, we think that it is not ambitious enough because of this fundamental right. But I would like to add one more additional dimension, which is quite often neglected in terms of discussion on rights and freedoms. I mean, if you have a chart, uh, if you have a provisions on rights and freedoms at the primary level, so at the level of treaties, it means that every action, every piece of legislation, every administrative decision made at the EU level must be compliant with the uh, treaty obligations with the in the situation with the EU Charter for uh, fundamental rights. So you cannot, for example, adopt a legislation that would allow for, uh, for example, selling goods to some countries that are heavily violating fundamental rights because or you cannot import goods from some countries that are violating um, uh, fundamental 
uh, rights. So also, this is like what we have now uh, against Russia, right? The sanctions. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Or for example, uh, you cannot allow for some uh, legislation on artificial intelligence without taking into account the content of the fundamental right of not to be, let's say, manipulated by the artificial intelligence, because this is one of those rights that is proposed uh, by the uh, by the manifesto von Ferdinand von Schirach. So I see here a great value, especially in the context of the EU administration, which is highly professional and which is really taking into account what is in the primary law. So without, so it, it is not like you know. Sorry to say it in in, uh, in Poland that sometimes you know you forget about rights because uh, you don't have the uh, ultimate uh, uh, organ, which is the constitutional court. You do not have like a proper judicial review to verify the quality of the legislation. I think in the context of the European Union, rights do matter and rights do provide a check for the legislative uh, before any legislation is passed. And also, I think you stressed also important um, um, element of the EU perception in the world that the EU is really a provider of certain standards um, which are uh, uh, accepted worldwide and if somebody or country like now Russia violates these standards we could have a very strong pressure on these countries uh, on these leaders on these administrations to to change the behavior uh, well uh, Manfred I have to ask you then now about this um, what you started to talk about what will be the next step when we have this idea uh, we have six new let's say proposal, six new articles proposed by Ferdinand von Schirach. Maybe it is not enough, maybe it's too much, maybe it can be formulated slightly differently, but the discussion has begun. So then what next do you expect, you expect it will happen? I mean, first of all, um, already within a very short period of time, we have more than 250,000 signatures. Uh, people um, in different countries started primarily in Germany and then Austria. Now it goes to other countries uh, like Poland um, supporting that. And I think it's also a question of awareness raising. Um, it's uh, human rights um, are on the one hand legal norms that need to be applied by the courts, etc. And that is already very important. But at the same time, these are ethical codes. These are codes of conduct for all of us, how we should actually behave, and also how we, what we should claim from governments, um, even outside the legal strategic litigation. So if there's a broad support for these rights in all the 27 member states, then Ferdinand von Gier is, is convinced, then the pressure is strong enough that we can really have these major changes. Of course, on the other hand, you have the more formal channels, the Conference on the Future of Europe, and that will all kind of um, interdependent. One is feeding into the other, um, but um, he really relies on public support. He says, we first have to change the minds of the people. Uh, and if they are convinced that uh, we are living in a world that is very fragile, and this is one of the ways and means how we can get out of that, in addition to the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, etc. But this is one that is more related to the idea of human rights. And we have seen that in the past. The development um, kind of discourse at a certain point realized if we frame our aims and objectives in the language of human rights, we are more successful because it has a different audience, it's a different appeal to the, the minds, but also the hearts of the people. In this context, we encourage um, uh, those who are listening to us not only to read the manifesto, to take the book, we have the English version, but we just publishing a Polish version, so we strongly recommend to, to, to take it, read it and think about it, but also to reflect and maybe support it in the form of a signature given online, we, after this book talk is over, will paste the website on the internet when you can find this petition and, and support the, the initiative. And Adam, the question for you would be, do you think it's feasible really to, to start discussing, to open the EU charter 
and add something? How is, uh, you know, how this can be really physically done? And is this possible at all in the nearest future? Uh, certainly, uh, the change of the EU charter would require uh, the, um, the change of the EU treaties. You cannot do it uh, otherwise. So, of course, it requires the consent of all the member states. Uh, and we know well that some member states are not very much sympathetic right now to the increased uh, European uh, integration. But I think the you know, we'll see what will be the, the result of the conference on the future of Europe. But in my opinion, this conference will not really answer to all questions, because I think the war in Ukraine is changing a lot. Uh, and we'll have to have uh, a serious discussion about uh, at least energy union, uh, military union, or at least creation of some European corpses, uh, maybe uh, some uh, aspects of the foreign relations policy by the EU, as well as the fiscal union. And in my opinion, sooner or later, we'll come back to the discussion uh, about the uh, maybe uh, even preparation of the new treaty. Uh, or maybe some significant amendments to the treaty, not only taking into account the conference on the future of Europe, but basically those challenges concerning Ukraine. And I think that in the meantime, our role should be to increase the public attention and public awareness concerning the increase of uh, rights that should be in the Charter. Moreover, uh, we are talking here only about those six rights in the Charter, but for example, I think the pandemic is also leading our discussion into uh, uh, whether uh, we should increase the protection of the right to health at the EU level. You know, it is also something, and you cannot do it without uh, uh, changing the charter because the current uh, guarantees of the right to health uh, uh, are not uh, sufficient. So I think that uh, this discussion about the future connected with this uh, manifesto Jeder Mensch uh, will be to great extent connected with some daily challenges for the European Union, and uh, and I think that this book and this initiative will get into like a proper uh, time and manner of discussing uh, potential new changes so in the EU infrastructure. To make it short, you expect uh, soon uh, a reopening of discussion around the treaties. Last treaty we have is the Treaty of Lisbon, which was written in 2007 and accepted, entered into force in 2009. So it has been a while we didn't touch the treaties. Manfred, your opinion on that? I mean, um, as you know, um, when we started the discussions on the Treaty of Lisbon, it was meant to become the constitution. So a big step towards the United States of Europe. And then we had, unfortunately, this referenda in the Netherlands and in France that actually stopped this project towards a constitutionalism. In 2005. Um, and, yes, and um, the Treaty of Lisbon is a kind of a compromise. And we see that in the everyday life of the European Union, how much we all suffer under this compromise because... Um, um, uh, you need for so many decisions unanimity in the council and uh, with 27 states uh, this is very very difficult so I think that the next step would have to go in this direction we have to strengthen the European Union um, and that means um, uh, extending the competences of the European Union. And you, you just mentioned the pandemic. I think also the, the competences of the Union in the field of healthcare are simply not sufficient. And, uh, and we have seen all the negative consequences. And now we have this, the EU sanction mechanism, I think is a very important new mechanism. Um, but again, we have to think about what does it mean um, that uh, there is the possibility, there's really a nuclear threat um, towards uh, the, the West, whatever the West is, but the European Union is certainly part of that. Um, and um, uh, how do we how do we react? Um, so I I think we should also I mean really taking seriously that the United Nations are dating from a time um, that is no longer really fit. Uh, the Security Council is not working simply um, and we have to change we have to uh, to strengthen the global governance 
But I think the European Union is a very good microcosm. Uh, if the European Union is really strengthened, it can have a leading role also on the global level to say we are living only in this one planet Earth. And we have to see that we survive also for future generations. It's not only the environmental question, it's also the nuclear question. Is there, there are so many threats to our survival that we really need to tackle and we can only do that uh, if, we are, if we are really working together and that's where the European Union has to start. So we are really confronting quite difficult times. Maybe that's the uh, transition period between, you know, the system, the old system towards a new one, where the discussion, also the discussion around human rights, rights of all of us, everyone of us, that's the title of the book of, of uh, Ferdinand von Schirach. It's very much needed because we confront right now war in Ukraine, a lot of violations of human rights, and at the same time with the technological revolution, we have to think about how to fit better into this reality with the rights we fight for. And I think that's the discussion we are in front of us. I strongly recommend all of us to read this manifesto. I don't, I didn't quote precisely the articles because I want to encourage you to look the book in the book and to read them yourself. Maybe you can have comments, please just be in touch with us. You can comment under this talk, what you think about these rights. And I'm very happy that we were able to present the Polish edition of the book on Ferdinand von Schirach with two distinguished law professors. Manfred Novak and Adam Bodnar. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure.